Welcome to the Nerd Nostalgic Podcast with your host, the Ginger It's Morbin time. <laughs> Hello, Beans. Hello, everybody. Howdy. Hope you're doing well. Hope you're doing good. As per usual, I'm your host, Luke the Human, and you're listening to the Nerd Stagit podcast with me. Now, uh, as you can see, and as you can tell from the uh, from the beginning, um, I'm reviewing the Morbius movie today. So I'm a bit excited. Um, I'm, I'm mostly curious to be honest. So I'm a, in kind of high spirits, which I don't think I should be, to be honest, for this movie. I should really have my hopes really low. Um, but we'll get into that, <laughs> all that in a minute. Um, first of all, got to do all the boring stuff. Uh, as per usual, um, don't forget to follow me on Twitter at nerdstagic underscore pod for all updates and everything that I'm watching, reading, playing, and all sort of nerdy things that I talk about on there. So don't forget to follow me on Twitter. Also, if you're listening on YouTube, don't forget to like, subscribe, and comment, and all that jazz. Uh, just go on, if you're not subscribed, go on to YouTube and search the Nerd Stagic Podcast and subscribe. I think as of recording this, um, I'm on 68 subscribers, which is actually incredible considering that we was at 64 not long ago. And we've jumped up quite a lot, so I do re- appreciate it greatly. Um, so as I mentioned. Today, I'm going to be watching the Morbius movie. I haven't watched it as of yet of doing the introduction. So I haven't got anything to say about the film other than um, what I know. Well, what basically what I've saw of other reviewers from last year and all the negative comments, really. Um, we'll get into that in, uh, in a little bit in a minute. Um, but you're probably all wondering, and I wouldn't blame you because if I was you, I would be thinking the same thing. Luke, why are you watching this piece of trash movie? Why are you doing it to yourself? Why are you watching this movie that only got 16% in Rotten Tomatoes? Why are you watching this movie that only made $167.5 million at the box office? I'm considering, actually, funny enough, um, this movie actually made more money than Shazam 2. Um, Shazam 2 is actually currently sitting um, at $103.4 million at the box office, which is a lot of money, but not for a superhero movie and definitely not for a DC movie. Um, I just wanted to bring that up because I just wanted to poke fun at Shazam too. Anyway, um, you are probably wondering, you know, as to why I'm doing it, and I'll be honest with you, I've I've got two answers. The most important is generally I've got major curiosity. Um, I know curiosity killed the cat, and I've heard all the negative things about this movie. Like I'll be honest with you, I don't like Jared Leto. I've never really, really been a fan of him. I think the only thing he's really good at is actually, you know, his band. Apart from that, I don't like him as an actor. Um, I don't understand the appeal of him as an actor. Um, but again, people seem to like him. People keep putting him in movies. I don't understand why. Like, I remember when he was announced as the Joker. And I, uh, me and most of the nerd culture kind of did that whole... No when you ever see anybody get kicked in the nuts. Or you see somebody uh, suck on a lemon. And then they make that sort of, ooh, sort of face. It was That, that was the face I made. I was like, mm, are you sure? Are you sure about that? Do you really want to be having him as the Joker? But again... I've got no say. I've got no control over who gets hired and who doesn't. So I kind of thought, like, okay, fair enough. I'll give him, as I do every single actor, or, you know, I'll give him the benefit of the doubt. And, well, we all know how that movie turned out and how we all know how his portrayal of the Joker planned out, which was just her- her- atrocious. You know, it was horrific. And it was that bad they didn't even bring him in for a cameo in Birds of Prey. They generally wrote the Joker out of that movie and was like, Harley Quinn don't need no man, which, again, she doesn't. She doesn't need no man. She's fantastic and perfect on her own but also the fact of we don't want Jared Leto anymore so we'll keep Harley Quinn um when we'll just get rid of the Joker uh, which you know made me laugh and the Birds of Prey movie I've watched it not that bad of a film not fantastic but it's not a bad movie that movie gets a bad rap and I just wanted to highlight how decent well not fantastic but somewhat good that film is Anyway, so it's curiosity. I'm generally curious about how this movie is. You know, are people just being cruel because it's Jared Lowe? Are people generally being mean because, you know, it's Sony and that Sony should be focusing more on the Spider-Man than the, you know, because at the moment Sony are trying to build their Spider-Verse, but the problem is they don't actually have Spider-Man in their Spider-Verse. 
So they're trying to do a spider verse. So you've got Morbius was meant to be like the beginning of it. And that kind of flat that was a flash in the pan, come and gone, right? And then they've currently they're filming, if not finished filming, uh the Craven the Hunter movie. Um, which is again fantastic. Oh but you know, I love Craven Hunter, but I, you know, Craven without Spider Man just I don't know if it'll work, but again, um we'll see how how that one goes. Uh, and then they're currently filming the Madam Web movie, which Madam Web is a very weird and obscure character. Don't be wrong. Again, Madam Web's fantastic. Even Morbius in in the comic books is a fantastic uh, character, and Craven Hunter. Um, but without Spider Man, there's not much more to them. You know, in terms of their own solo movies, you can do solo movies, but you've got to add in, you know, the Spider Man connection. You know. Um, and again, Madam Web is very much to do with the Spider Verse, very much to do with other Spider Man. You know, not just Peter Parker, but Miles Morales and all the other multi dimension Spider Man. Um, so I don't know how they're going to do that film. From what I've heard, it's meant to be a time travel sort of movie set in the past with Peter Parker's parents. I don't know that for sure. That's what I've heard rumblings on Reddit and online. Um, so I don't know if that's true or not. But the only thing that Sony has actually done with Spider Man that was actually decent and i'm not counting the spider-man movies i'm I'm not counting them at all um is venom um with tom hardy you know venom one was amazing i think it did better than they even thought they they thought it would do um venom 2 again did a lot better than anybody thought it would do i'll be honest i liked venom 2 but i feel like they kind of ruined carnage you know woody house and played a good sort of cletus cassidy but in all fairness how they used him, I didn't much like, and they could have used it a lot better. And I don't know, the film just—it was great, and it was—it was—it was a fun sequel. I just—I don't know. I just hoped for more. And one thing I—I I kind of wish they would do with those movies is more blood. You know, you've—if you're going to bring in Carnage, you've got to have the rip and the tear. You've got to have the the blood and the guts. You know, that that movie should have been bumped up to an R rated, because. You already had the the audience from the first movie. The first movie made a lot of mo- money, so they should have then bumped it up, being like, okay, the first movie made a lot of money. A lot of people want to go see it. A lot of people love Venom. You know, uh, we have our audience. We have the people that want to go see it. Let's bump it up to our raid. You know, let's bring in Andy Circus to direct. I love Andy Circus. I've spoke highly about him many times. Um, you know, let's bring in Carnage. Let's bring in Woody Harrelson, and let's just have them go at it, fight. You know, let some rip and tear. Let's see blood. Let's see gore. That's what I thought they should have done. But you know, apart from Venom, that's the only really decent thing that they've done since you know, obviously Spider Man. Um, so in terms of when Sony was said they were going to do a Morbius movie without Spider Man, I was very much on the fence. And then, like I said, when they said they were going to have um, Jared Leto in the cast, I was very much the fact of oh, okay. This ain't gonna go well. I already, I don't know. It was, I could already have the inkling of like this might not go as well as I hoped. Um, but you know, I, as I did with most things, I try to have hope. I try to see things um, as they are, not as I would like them to be. You know what I mean? Like, yeah, I'd love, for example, I'd love to see Galactus in, you know, a Fantastic Four movie. But you know, you can't put Galactus in straight away. You've got to build up to Galactus. So you know, I'd love to see that, but. You've got to build the characters up first, you know. So the reason I bring it up is because they are they are doing a Fantastic Four movie that's not coming to like 2024, 2025. But the the point I'm trying to make is the fact of I can't project what I want onto a film because I'm going to set myself up for heartache, you know what I mean? And I feel like a lot of fandoms and a lot of, you know, sort of movie fans and video game fans that do this where they put their own wants and their own sort of, um, thoughts and theories into what they think should happen or could happen or is meant to happen because it happens in the comics and then they watch the movie and they're disappointed because it's not what they hyped up in their brain to be so it is pure curiosity generally I want to see is this movie as, as bad as people say you know I love Michael Keaton as the vulture I you know, I can understand how they managed to bring him in because the whole sort of, you know, um, spider uh, in the last Spider-Man movie, how he messed with the multiverse and some characters were pulled and dropped into different places. You know, it's all a bit sort of Magoo at the moment. But like, I thought, you know, OK, like, I look, like Matt Smith's in it. I love Matt Smith. Again, big Doctor Who fan. He's in this film, you know. So you have sort of the things that pique my curiosity. It's just, you know, I'm hopeful 
that I can try to find some sort of light in this dark movie. Um, and when I say dark, I don't mean dark because it's dark, like, you know, mature dark. I think just dark because it's a vampire film, you know, so I'd kind of hope there'd be some sort of, you know, some darkness and I don't know. Um, so that was my first point. You know, it's, it's pure curiosity. You know, I'm just purely curious. Um, second point, which is a lot shorter than the first point, um, basically, so you don't have to. There's a lot of people out there who haven't watched this movie, and I don't blame you. And I'll be completely honest with you, Beans. Um, if it wasn't for the podcast, I wouldn't watch this movie. Because all the negativity that I've heard, and all the people have said how bad this film is, um, and, you know, it's it's like 16% on Rotten Tomatoes, it's very low scored. Um, generally, I wouldn't, I wouldn't want to touch it. But because I got the podcast, I figured, you know, this is a movie from last year that I didn't watch. Um, and it's currently free to watch um, on Now TV here in the UK. So I figured I'd give it a go. Might as well give my thoughts and feelings. And again, so you beans don't have to, you know. And, and I guess if you listen to this now, you either have watched the movie or you haven't. And like me, you're curious. Um, so that's my, my hope, really. Um, but there's a potentiality that this video, this episode will flop. But that's that, that's fine, you know. Can't all be winners. Can't all be uh uh, kind of sort of get the gold star at the end of the day um but yeah you know it, it's it's just pure curiosity you like sony re-released this movie into cinemas because people online basically trolled sony because the whole they they basically made the whole morbid time sort of thing trend and then some executive was at sony was like i know the movie didn't do well at first but you know it's currently trending everywhere on like facebook and instagram and twitter and reddit and all that and people go morbid time so let's re-release it and they re-released it and they made a bit more money but not as much as they thought they were going to uh, do it um which I've, I've never heard of any sort of movie do that before where it's you know it starts to get hype online and then they re-release it I've never heard any film doing that, you know what I mean. So again, it it it's it feels already like a joke, you know. And if it, it is a joke online, you know. Still, if they still get people who you see it every time a new sort of comic book movie trailer comes up, you'll always get somebody saying, "Oh, you know, Morbius was underrated," or "It's Morbin time." You know, you always get it. So it's the curiosity, really, for me. So I'm going to go off now. I'm going to go watch the film so you guys don't have to. Um, will I enjoy it? Will I won't enjoy it? Well, I guess we'll see in a minute. Um, and yeah, so nothing much more to say. I will see you on the other side. Hopefully it's all right. If it isn't, I'll let you know. We will see. So on to the review. Right, so here we are, the Morbius review. So as recording this, I've not long uh, finished watching the movie. Um, if anything, it was about five minutes ago as I got all my notes together and rushed upstairs to um, start recording. Um, so it's still quite fresh in my mind. I've got a lot to say, got a lot to get into. Um, honestly, I think you'll be surprised with my thoughts and feelings of this film. Not overly surprised. I don't don't worry, I'm not going to say anything outrageous like it's the best movie I've ever seen, like Morbin Time, like I'm over there for it, like I'm on the bandwagon, like no, no, no. Don't get it twisted, like I'm not going to shock you that much. But I will probably say some things that might surprise you, but I will try my best to to back them up and try to make them as clear as possible. So, um overall, let's just get into it, you know. So, for starters, the movie, it starts off interesting. I would say, you know, there's an interesting premise to Morbius. Um, I will say now, at the very beginning, I will be talking about spoilers, mainly because, well, two really obvious reasons. One, if you're going to watch this movie by now, you really would have. Um, and two, you don't want to watch this movie. Because again, if you had watched it, you would have seen it already. So you probably don't care. So at this point, you're just with me being just completely curious. So I will be talking about spoilers. So I just want to throw that out so nobody can say, oh, you know, I was going to watch Morbius tomorrow. Well, why are you here? <laughs> you know what I mean? Not to sound horrible, but, you know, I'm just saying spoilers just in case. Right. Um, so as I mentioned, like the movie starts off interesting. It is got an interesting premise interesting start um morbius michael uh from a young age he has a rare disease which means that um his body i think his body congeals his blood meaning that 
it, it's like it blood basically turns to, to mush, which means because it's not flowing, he eventually does his whole body shuts down. So he needs about three transfusions a day to live. Um, and then we ended up meeting um, this other boy um, who he calls Milo, which is Matt Smith's character. Um, and we meet him and he's got the same disease and they kind of spark up a friendship there. Now, as I mentioned, it, it's quite interesting sort of set up. You get to see them with their kids and we kind of get to see Michael as he grows up and how that he's like, he's really sort of like genius, you know, uh, got, his, got his doctorate at 19, that sort of thing. Like top of his class, really clever bloke. Um, and it really sets it up sort of really well to kind of make sure like this guy, you know, He's he's a, he's smart, but he's dying. So he's trying his best to find anything, anything that can cure him and his friend Milo of this rare, rare sort of blood disease. As well as he's trying his best to um, save other people that he has mostly made synthesized blood, and that has helped a lot of people. If for in terms of blood donations and that sort of thing, because um, that's a real world thing that we that we struggle with in the real world is the fact of not enough people are donating um, blood and donating plasma so there's not enough of it around so the idea of having a synthetic blood so that um, those people that don't donate we still have a good supply of people that do need the blood it will help them sort of live so you know it kind of sets it up like this guy's a genius but he's also sort of he's dying but again he's a doctor first and foremost and he's trying his best to um, save other people as well as saving himself so he's not overly sort of evil so it sets it up quite interesting. Um, one thing that I do want to mention, and I will mention this all the way through um, this review, is the editing. Um, even though the beginning, the part where you first meet them, where you transition from um, Michael as a kid to Michael as an adult, the editing is done in such a way where there are certain scenes where it makes no sense. You've got one scene where Michael is a young kid, he's in an office with the sort of main doctor. And he's talking to him, he's talking about, you know, you've got a gift, Michael. I don't want to see it wasted here. I want you to go off, uh, go to New York to an institution where they will sort of give you ed education as well as they will kind of, you know, make sure that you live and survive as with your condition. Um, but, you know, I want you to go and excel and, you know, be this genius. Um, and he's like, what about Milo? I can't leave him without without me. He won't be all right. He goes, I'll look and the doctor's like, I'll look after him. And then it cuts to another scene where Milo's getting beaten up. And then we start to see that Milo has a has a, a very sort of cruel sort of mean streak. Um, that's always like that. It's like that sort of like you read between the lines. You know, like he looks all cute and lovely on the outside, but he's got his raw inner sort of like mean sort of violent side to him. Um, but then it cuts back again to now Michael. He's now a kid again, and he's saying, "But what about Milo?" And he's like, "Why well, is Milo be okay? I look after him." And then you basically cut back to another scene where Milo's getting beaten up. It's, it's very jump cutty. It's very much like. The, in the editing process, it was like you could have just left that scene to run and then showed Milo get it beaten up. But for some reason, they, they cut it. Milo get beats up. Then we have back to Michael. I mean, it, Milo gets beaten up. We get back to Michael and the doctor talking. Then we go back to Michael being beaten up and then the doctor's there. It's very much of like, you know, I don't know what they were going for in certain editing, but, you know, that pick really sort of lets it down. Um, so, <laughs> you know, even though the beginning is quite interesting, it's it's very much the fact of you know if you could stomach the editing, you know it, you might see some form of enjoyment in it. Uh, the next part is uh, I can see now why they chose Jed Letter to be um, Morbius. It's because he he looks like a vampire. You know what I mean? Like he he you put you 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 smack some like pale like white face paint on him, and he does look vampirish. You know, and I I can see where they're going for because especially when he has when he has the full beard on, and he has the long hair, and the way he sort of tilts his eyes, the very sort of psycho esque sort of eyes, because he it's it's called the psycho stare. I think that's what it's called. But basically, it, it's the sort of idea that you can try it at home. So if you're in front of the mirror, or if you want to pause this and go find a mirror, find yourself a mirror, tilt your head down, right, and then look up through the eyebrows. So you look up to yourself through the eyebrows. And if you catch your reflection in the mirror, it's called it's it's the glare that um, Hitchcock basically perfected for the movie Psycho was that it was a way to make somebody look crazy, look demented, look insane, just by having you know this facial feature of just looking down and looking up through the eyebrows with, with your eyes. There's a lot of that, and it does work. I've tried it. I've scared myself because how well th this technique works. So definitely give it a go at home. Um, 
but he does look like a vampire. And I, again, I can see where the casting was like, yeah, that guy looks that guy looks like a vampire. That guy looks ill, you know. <laughs> um, and it does work, you know, even without when they when they when Michael eventually does become a, the living vampire, and you know, you can get the CGI and and the prosthetics, you know, on. Even before that, he does look like yeah, yeah, I could believe him as Dracula. You know, I could believe him as as a vampire in Blade. You know, it it works like that. Um, so that bit makes a bit more sense to me. But again, I'm still not sold on Jared Leto as an actor. But I can see what they were going for with with hiring him for this role. Um, then we sort of skip on ahead. So now that um, Michael, you know, he's again the movie starts very odd as well because movie starts like when he's an adult and he goes down into um i think it's columbia finds himself some vampire bats and captures them and then it jumps back to when he was a kid so now we've jumped back to him being an adult again right and uh, now he's got these vampire bats and that he's doing basically illegal experiments basically transfu- transfusing um human blood with vampire bats because vampires are the only cre- well not vampires Bats are the only creatures, not all bats, but vampire bats, you know, the ones that uh, drink blood. They're the only creatures that have a diet of blood. They're, they have a um, sort of sli- a chemical in their sliver that um, allows the, the, the blood to not co- coagulate, um, you know, go all jelly-like so they can actually get the nutrients and stuff they need out of it. Um, so Michael thinking, well, is there's a way that I can kind of get this sort of saliva this sort of gland to mix with human blood there might be a way that i can create a cure um for my condition and milo's condition and cure this blood disease completely and also you know find it it can be used other things as well so you know in this is where it tends to get a bit sort of you know anti-hero you know they've set up in this little beginning that michael is a doctor he's a good person he's trying to save the world but also it makes him seem quite evil as well very sort of you know mad scientist sort of thing and again, I don't. It, it it it's a mix between Jared Leto, Jared Leto's sort of acting in this scene, as well as kind of the atmosphere and where it is. Like it's a very dark lab. You got bats everywhere. He looks really pale. He already looks like he's ill or infected. You know what I mean? So it's 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 one of those where it's like still a bit sort of odd. But you know, we we keep going, and then it jump cuts again and we we meet milo and milo's basically you know he's just as bad as um michael but he's trying he's he basically he's living life he's like i ain't got much life to live so i'm gonna gamble sleep around um i'm just gonna live life you know and you know they're best friends and you know they try their best to kind of you know get around get around with life while also both being ill having the crutches and basically morbius says to uh milo that like I think I've found a cure for us, but it isn't c- completely legal. It isn't completely, you know, it's not above board at all. That this is completely like sort of off the off the records, off the books. I'm going to have to do it in like international waters. It's that illegal uh, because it, it it was it's never implied in the movie. Really, it would have been nice for a bit of dialogue to kind of imply this to make this a bit more sense because it makes no sense at all. Um, it's because apparently Milo's character. Oh, well, I was going to say Matt Smith's character, Milo, he funds all of uh, Michael Mor- Morbus' work and research, right? But it's never stated anywhere, if anything, you could just take off the beginning of the movie where you first meet Milo as a kid, how he's getting out of a Rolls Royce. Um, that's the only thing that's implied, that Milo actually has money, or his family has money even. But it's never sort of applied anything. It's just the fact of, you know, he funds it all. And it costs a lot of money, and apparently he has money, you know. So that bit again, that I'm just being nitpicky. That was something that kind of got me. But we finally get to the point where like this movie starts getting a bit interesting, and it does. This movie starts getting interesting quite quickly. Within 25 minutes of this film starting, um, you know, the action starts to come in, and this is where I would say the fun starts to begin. Cause like I said, the, the beginning, even I'm, I'm I'm kind of nitpicking here and there. And there are certain things like the editing and stuff like that that really sort of angst me. Overall, the beginning is actually, in my opinion, the best part. You know, it sets it really well. You get to know the characters. You get to know the sort of reasoning behind Dr. Morbus's work and what he's doing and his obsession. Um, you know, how much he cares for his friend, uh, Milo, as well as, you know, these 
well not partner but like the nurse that he works with his relationship with her um his relationship with his patients and how he's trying to save them look after them you know all this jazz it sets up really really well right and then we get to the transformation where like he's finally finally found a cure he's in international waters and he injects himself um with this so and cure that he's found right and this is again like i said this is where the interest in and the fun starts to take over if anything the horror aspect of this movie starts to kind of really settle in um because in this scene you have michael morbus's transformation right so he's he's turned into to a man a living vampire you know what you would imagine you know for example um dracula you know very much on in the vein of blade that sort of thing um it's really cool. The CGI is on point. You know, you can tell that, you know, they've put a lot of time into the way into the way he looks, the way he moves. Because, like, the best way I can explain it, think of Nightcrawler from the X-Men. Uh, whenever Nightcrawler poofs from one place to another, he always leaves, like, a trail of smoke. It's a lot like that. So when he moves, it's very sort of liquidy. It's very smoky. It's very interesting. It's, I've never seen anything like it before done in this way whenever trying to portray on screen that character is moving extremely fast usually it's just a blur or it's just like like a flash like a do 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 like here to here but in this it's very much like it's like liquid motion it's like he's like it's kind of like michael and the audience can see air you know the air around us that we breathe it's like that is a thing it's like it's like see uh, I, i'm going to sound crazy i'm trying my best to explain this but i don't know how to explain it it's, again it's a very visual sort of thing it's what you would imagine you know what if you was wear pot goggles on and put your head under the water if you could see water being moved out of the way as you swam through it or i mean like under the water not above the water obviously you know that's what it would look like you know you could actually imagine what it's like to move air out your way like I, I don't know how to explain it. It's just really interesting. It's very smoky sort of vibes. And I love that. Like it, it suits the vampiric sort of style of not just Morbius, but vampires in general. So I really love that. I've never seen it done before. Um, one thing that I have an issue with, and again, it's another thing that I will mention in this review a lot. And it, mainly because it angsts me, because you would imagine, right... This is a movie about a living vampire. A vampire, you know. Um, you would imagine there would be blood. Because that's what vampires eat. You know, that's what they live on. Blood. Human blood, you know, to be specific. Um, so you would imagine when sort of Morbius sees the red, you know, shall we call it, you would think there would be sort of a lot of gushing of blood, you know, like proper true blood, very sort of, you know, a Dracula sort of thing, like biting of the neck and to see the blood trickling down, blood around the face, blood around the mouth. Um, you know, when he really sort of rips somebody's jugular out or slits their throat, blood goes everywhere. You would imagine that, but you don't get it. You know, you, you'll get like the inklings of like, you know, red where, the, where blood is starting to seep through somebody's clothes or starting to drip down their neck. But you'll never actually see the wound. You never see the gush of blood or anything like that. Morbius never, never has blood on his mouth. He never has blood on his clothes. Right. Um, and don't be wrong. The, the, there is a cool effect that they use. They use a, they use the blood splatter. Like it's on the screen. So whenever Morbius slices somebody, you'll get on the actual screen itself. You get blood splatter on the screen kind of like a 3d sort of effect as well as like there'll be blood that spurt up the walls but it's not enough it's 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 not enough blood you know i i, I it, it looks cool to have the blood splatter but i want more blood i want more i want gruesomeness i want to feel like he's literally tore that person's throat out you know that like their their throat's been slit that he's drinking the blood that he's covered in it that he's craving blood make me believe that not just he's a vampire and he but also make me believe that he's craving the blood don't make me see like oh yeah he slashes him this guy and slashes that guy and be very spooky be very creepy because all this takes place on a boat right on a boat in the middle of the ocean you know you have to think of it kind of like aliens there's nowhere to go no one can hear you scream you know, and he's hunting these sort of mercenaries down one by one and picking them off really cool and killing them. And they're slashing and, you know, people are getting slashing the stomach, slashing the throat. He's picking them up and he's dropping them. Like there'd been many moments where, like, I would have loved to just see Michael because this, 
there's 12 pints of blood. There will give or take 12 pints of blood in a human, right? That's a lot of blood. If you put that in your bath, that's enough to drown, okay? That's a lot of blood, okay? Now, there's a scene in, in, in this moment where he picks somebody up, right? And you can tell that he's bit him. You can hear the, the, the sound where he's bit him in the neck. It's, it's very sort of... Um, very like you know moist and very sort of gushy sort of sounds very sort of like you know sort of sort of sounds and then you, he drops him right if i was directing this film at that moment right i don't i won't really push there at that moment i would have had like a waterfall of blood like just kind of because morbid picks this guy up <coughs> pardon me picks this guy up puts him into like the shadows so you can't see the body right and then drops him so he's in the shadows. What I would have done is the fact that I always had like a waterfall of blood of like he's hear the gushing sounds and you could just see like he's you could just imagine that he must have ripped this guy's neck open or ripped up like tore this guy in half and he's just <laughs> supping the blood out, you know, and it it's really adds to the fear factor like this guy is dangerous. This this, you know, he's a threat. He's a monster. He's an abomination. You've got to take him down, you know, and then you that might make you feel care for the nameless mercenaries you know what i mean it might do it might not do but you know add in the fear factor because that's what they try many times in this movie this movie tries to be scary tries to be horror tries to be suspense you know again it makes sense because you've got a character who's a vampire who sucks blood who is a creature of the night you know make use of that show me it don't just show me trickles of blood here and there and a little bit of splatter on the screen um so it was that part that really bothered me. And again, I'll mention it a couple more times in this review. So don't you worry. Um, one, another thing that I liked um, was the echolocation. Um, Michael Morby says, again, as bats do, echolocation, which means he can hear things. He has really good sensitive hearing. Um, so he can hear things going on like in the building or in the street, what's going on. Kind of like a, a Spider-Man's sort of spidey sense or like... Um, Superman superhero in that sort of thing he can kind of pinpoint where certain things are what's happening and sort of find out sort of if people are in trouble or not um so that was really cool at this point onwards so oh also one thing I forgot to mention about the echolocation that's another thing that I love the echolocation looks cool it kind of brings in the whole sort of smoky soupy sort of you know liquid motion way of, of doing how morbius runs and uh, how uh, to show how fast he's going they use the same sort of thing for when he's using echolocation event again it's very much as if he can see wind and he can feel the wind and he can feel the motion of 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 the wind and the air currents and he uses that to fly and stuff like that it's really really interesting it looks really cool you know but this is the part of of the movie after this point, this is where it starts getting silly, right? And this is where it starts getting very much of, um, well, I'll get into it, right? There's a lot to get into, right? So it starts off with basically <laughs> friend is deliberately be, being vague with best friend and makes an enemy out of them trope, right? So there's basically, we've seen this trope before in, in movies where, you know, one friend has something that the other friend wants or is hiding something and it should really easily just tell his, tell their friend of like it's x y and z this is why i'm i'm being vague you know don't be vague just tell them like you know there's it's this thing or it's that thing right that way you know you can kind of keep face and be like look i'm being open i'm being honest but we see it many times in movies where they they they're deliberately vague with a holding information away from them and it's no different here so you basically get the moment where um Milo finds out that things went wrong on the boat. So he basically goes to find Michael, goes to find his friend to kind of see if he's okay, try to look after him, right? Which as you would expect, as friends do. He gets into the laboratory where Michael is. Obviously, Michael's been doing tests. Michael's been, been trying to see how long he can last without blood, trying to sort of realise um, how long he can last on his synthetic blood and that sort of thing. Um, again, quite interesting, quite interesting scene, you know, kind of adds a lot more character to him now that he's kind of got his strength and got his energy back and he's kind of back to normal with also the bonus of super speed, super strength and all the vampire stuff as well. Um, we get to see Michael Morbius in his element. We actually get to see him be a doctor, uh, a doctor, be um, be a genius, you know what I mean? Trying to figure things out, trying to plan things. Again, very interesting, right? 
But us, uh, so he's trying to do cold turkey now. He's locked himself in this sort of like cage. Um, Milo finds there, gets him. He's like, what's the matter, Michael? What's the matter? Michael's like, I need blood. So um, Milo goes, gets him some synthetic blood, gives it to him, is in shock to see uh, Morbius just pulls it off him and starts drinking it straight out like a Slurpee, right? You know what I mean? One of them. He's like, what happened to you? What's the matter? Like, uh, you know, I don't I don't understand. What, what, what are you drinking blood for? And then he, he can see that he's changed, that he's different and he's walking about and he looks healthier and he doesn't look ill. And Milo's like, what's the matter? Help explain to me. And then deliberately, for no reason whatsoever, Michael was just being really vague with him. And like, I can't tell you. You wouldn't understand. You won't get it. Um, you know, I'm trying to protect you. I'm, I'm sitting there thinking, all right, you, this is where it's starting to get. This is, the, this is the mark where everybody who ever reviewed this movie, this is the part where I was like, okay, now I can see what they meant when this film starts to get silly. And I, you know, you don't, you can't always tell with a movie, but there are certain films that you watch where you can just tell just by how certain things that happen where you're like, okay, this is where the movie starts getting dumb, isn't it? You know, you just get that feeling of like, it's going to go downhill, isn't it? And that's the feeling that I got. Now, it didn't go completely downhill. Trust me, when we get there, I'll explain it. Um, But it started to get silly at this point. Right, because again, there was no reason for Michael to be very vague with Milo about why he couldn't tell him. He should have told him of like, yeah, I messed up. You know, I thought I had a cure and it did work, but you know, it's made me into a monster. It's made me crave blood. Like, yes, it's given me all these benefits, but you know, um, it's not ready. I'm trying to find a cure. I'm, I'm, I, I don't know how long I'm going to last on synthetic blood. Eventually, I'm gonna not like. I can only last so long on synthetic blood and until basically I'm going to need the red stuff. I'm going to need human blood, which again, I'll be honest with you. Never once did Morbius ever say that he, he needed specifically human blood. Well, he does, but he never explains that he's never tried anything else. Like it would be nice for like a scene where he's like, I've tried, I've tried pig's blood. I've tried, you know, cow blood. I've tried, you know, bloods of different types of animals. Didn't work. Like you, you don't get any scenes like that. It's just the fact of I need human blood. I just need human blood. I've eaten. I've drunk. All I've all I've eaten is human blood. So that's all I need. I'm like, well, even vampire bats don't suckle off humans. Vampire bats suckle off cows and other like other things like that. You know, other sort of animals that they find. So, you know, you don't actually need human blood. Um, and I again, it would have been nice for them to have a scene or a bit of dialogue that would go, yeah, I've tried this, I've tried that, it doesn't work, it seems the only substitute is human blood. And it would have made it a bit more believable. But again, I'm just nitpicking here or, here or there, really. Um, so yeah, so again, because Michael is incredibly unnecessarily vague with Milo, he ends up making an enemy out of Milo, which then sets up the, the big bad for the rest of the movie, to be honest. Um then, you know, as the movie goes on, like editing again, it's all over the place. You know, at times it feels like there were two separate movies. Like there were two movies that wanted to be made um, at this at this point was like one person wanted to make a horror movie, tried to make a sort of uh, vampire sort of horror superhero style sort of film. And then it feels like somebody else was like, no, let's pull back. Let's not do that. And let's try to make a different sort of goofy, silly film um, with jokes. And uh, let's just pull back on the gore. Let's pull back on the blood. Let's pull back on everything. And let's just really just make this safe, right? Um, because it does. It stinks of studio interference, right? It's it's like it has that smell on it. Because like I said, th- there are t- moments where this movie goes hard in trying to be a horror sort of scary sort of film. But then it pulls back when you don't see the blood, when you don't see the gore, when you, you know, when you can tell that there must, there had to be gore in the, it feels like there were gore in these scenes originally, that there were blood spurts and that in these scenes originally, but it feels like that was taken out or reshot, you know what I mean? Um, and that's what it feels like. It has that stink of like, because the, how the editing works. At, again, the editing was bad at the beginning, but I just took that as the fact of, you know, they just wanted to get to the point of Michael being an adult. That was my inkling. But when you get to this part in the film where you sort of Michael, like, wait, again, the part where it says it starts getting silly, you can tell, like, it was like the first part of the film that we watched was shown to the studio. And the studio were like, yeah, I like it. 
but it's too violent. Not we can't have it, you know. So let's change gears and let's sort of keep what we got. But like from this point on, we we don't want that. Just make it a sort of silly, sort of goofy sort of movie. Um, and the studio were like, and you know, the director and everybody else was like, well, okay, that's not really what I wanted to do. But you know, if I say no, you cut my funding and cancel the movie. So I guess I gotta follow it. Again, this is all me being speculative, but it it has that stink of collusion he has that stink of interference it's so much um and i mentioned it again <laughs> i actually wrote it down in my notes uh, like again the average human has about 12 pints of blood uh, there needs to be more gore like again uh, again part of the editing as well you know there are moments when milo attacks a woman like again it's a really creepy scene it's a really good scene actually and it would have been even better i feel like with the gore but there's a scene where you had this random nurse and she's walking down this hallway and as she's walking down the hallway, the lights start to turn off behind her. So she runs and she's panicking. And she's, you know, you know, she's proper in motion, really fear intensive sort of scene. And she runs, she runs, she runs, she runs. She finally gets the light switch, turns the light switch on. Uh, all the lights behind her come back on. She turns around, nobody there. She's, she kind of puts her back um, to the wall. She's finally relaxing, starting to calm down. And then we have a bit of a jump scare where a hand comes out of nowhere, grabs her. And then we have a zoom out sort of scene where sort of a monster, which is we we at, in that moment we were led to believe that it was Michael. Turns out it was actually Myla. But zoom out and we actually see like somebody feeding on this woman in a very sort of long shot. Um and again you have those horror moments, you have those horror scenes and you could tell that they were really trying to push that horror thing. But again, you know, you because you've cut away, because you've pulled away, you've you've taken away the the sort of the, the the blood you know you've taken away the, the essence of that scene you know that scary scene like show me it and there's another moment where like milo is then decided to now basically you know be sort of uh a bachelor go out sort of chat up girls at a bar it gets into a bit of an altercation and then it's sort of the the he he goes to leave the leave the bar and you just think okay he left the bar right and then it goes to another scene where you, you, you've got Michael and he's doing what he's doing. And then there's this like news sort of scene. And then you've got of this crime scene in the back of this sort of um, parking lot of all these guys that had the issue with Milo. And you don't actually get to see him attack them. There's no scene of it. It's just generally CCTV footage and an image of a vampire looking sort of creature, which as we know is Milo, um, surrounded by these bodies with pools of blood. Like you, like there are moments where you, you see pools of blood around people's bodies and you can see blood spurred up um, the walls, but it's not enough. It's not enough what you'd imagine. Like you, they keep showing how razor sharp Morbius's claws are, right? And how that they could split somebody open. And even there, there's a moment where you actually see Milo attack um, his father figure, the the main sort of doctor who's looked after both Milo and Morbius since they were young. Um, and you actually see he turns around and he slashes his stomach, right? And you actually, and this again, this is what I mean editing, which is the editing is really stupid. As he went, as he slices him, you can tell that his arm is drenched, is red, right? His arm is drenched in blood, right? And then it quickly cuts to another editing scene when when he falls on the ground, where he's now his white shirt is now back from being red to white, and he's just got these about three or four red lines on his stomach, where obviously you can tell he slashed his stomach. Like I'm like, what? I've just seen him a red, like he's he's covered in red. It's blood. I know it's blood. And now you've you've changed the scenes and how he's he's. Shirt is now pristinely white, only it's red in one place, and it's red a bit and on the collar because obviously the, he slashed his face. Which again, we don't see much of his face where he slashed him. It just looks like a big welt where, he's, if anything, he's punched him. And and again, they you can tell where like originally there was probably planned to be a lot of blood uh, because you can tell they had the proper special effects with the proper vi- like. Um, Blood, blood splatter maybe um, but then they just decided to change that I don't know it just feels again very sort of silly but like I said there's a lot of blood in people you, you're a vampire film show the blood it's okay you know what I mean like it's it's fine you know you can it's okay you know um, and that's what I mean like there, there are hints at horror there's a hint at a potential R rating or even an 18 but it just feels like 
this movie was held back. And it just feels like the studio came in and just pulled back the reins. Was like, no, no, we ain't doing this type of film. You know, we ain't doing it. We, 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 we you know, we're not making our rated movie. We're not making a movie for you know teenagers and the adults. This is a film for everybody. So let's pull back on it. But they still kept the horror tones, which makes no sense. Like, if you're going to pull back on the blood, if you're going to pull back on everything that, you know, if you're going to start making a vampire movie and you just want to make a superhero movie, you know, then why keep the horror aspects? Why keep the, the sort of scary sort of scenes, which, you know, the suspensefulness, the the um, whole sort of creepy vibe, why keep that if you're not going to show anything of a, you're not going to show blood? You know what I mean? It just does make sense. Again, it's a sponge cake with no filling. And the filling is blood flavored, right? You've got everything on top that you need, but you 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 just didn't go all the way with the filling, and it's it's just bland, you know. Um, and again, this is what I love about comic books. You know, this is why I love reading graphic novels and comic books because, you know, they're very adult, they're very mature stories. You know what I mean? I, and I feel that that because th- there's a lot of how can I, how, what's the word I'm looking for. There's a lot of things going on at the moment with superhero movies that the general movie going audience are getting a bit tired of. Um, and they, I, I'd say even some sort of um, comic book and, and superhero movie fans are getting a bit tired of is the fact of a lot of the movie studios, obviously mainly sort of uh, Marvel and DC, they're playing it safe. You know, um, I think I said this well for the Doctor Strange sort of. Um, review even though i love that movie you can tell that sam raimi he was allowed to do what he wanted and he went for it and don't be wrong that film's fantastic and it's still one of my favorite um superhero movies of this um of its stage four or five that we're on now um but you could tell that that movie could have been a lot darker there could have been a lot more to it and it just feels like the reins had to be pulled back of like no we can't go that far you know what i mean um and i feel like it's time to stop worrying so much about that. That, you know, we like Deadpool proves it. We can do an R-rated superhero movie and it, people, it will still make a lot of money and people still will go to see it. You know what I mean? I'm not saying go dark. I'm not saying go brooding and, and emotional and, and sort of di- whatever DC we're trying to do. I don't mean like that, but I'm like, tell mature stories, you know, show you know, one thing that I loved about Iron Man 3, even though people don't like Iron Man 3, one thing I love about Iron Man 3 is that it really went into Tony Stark's PTSD. It really went into Tony Stark having panic attacks and anxiety attacks and having moments where, like, he felt like he couldn't breathe, like the world was too much, that he had too much on his shoulders. Those are the moments that I loved about that film. And those are the mature sort of adult sort of moments that we all sort of deal with because we all have mental health issues. We all struggle with, with our own sort of demons, you know. And I want you to, I want these comic book movies to go into the more mature side of it, you know, show the human aspect of it. And again, if you're going to do a movie with a vampire and you're going to keep it, you know, horror side of it, show the blood, you know, show the gore. Even if you don't want to, like, you don't have to show intestines, all right? I'm not saying, like, I don't have to show me him slicing somebody's stomach and, like, intestines falling out. Like, that's, again, that's too far. You don't need to show me that, right? But make me believe that he's actually feasting. You know, that's what I'm asking for. Make me believe that he's actually feasting on somebody. You know, that that, that, that he's got at least put blood around his mouth. Because there's never once where anybody, when they were doing the CGI, again, the CGI looks great. You know, when Morbius turns into a vampire, and you've got his vampire sort of face. Again, it looks incredible. But not once did anybody on the anime team was like, let's just put a bit of blood, a bit trickling down the side of, the, the side of his mouth for, you know, on his chin or just around his gob. Like, not once do you get any of that blood. Like, his clothes never get blood on him. He's constantly pressed in. It's kind of like this guy doesn't miss a drop. Like, he gets every single drop. He doesn't spill it. You know what I mean? Like, no, that's a, gu- that's a gusher. Like, even if, right, you know, even if you was able to clamp down on somebody's neck, okay, right? I've seen enough vampire movies to, you know, to know this, right? Even, like that's your juggler on your neck, right? That's your main artery that goes from your heart. Okay, that thing is constantly pumping, and that is like the expressway. Okay, that thing is high powered, ready to burst at any moment. Okay, if you burst that vein, 
you are going. It's it's going. It's a spurter. It's going to spurt, right? You got it's going to leak. So no matter how good he is, right, at sort of drinking blood, he's going. He's he's going to miss bits, and it's going to go down their body. It's going to go down their neck. It's he's going to get it all over him. And when he pulls away, there's still going to be loads left, right? Somewhat, just make me believe that you know he's drinking blood. Just make me believe that what what he's he, what that's what he's doing. Make me believe that he's a vampire. Like yeah, you show me all these cool CGI moves and all these things, and yeah, he looks like a vampire. He looks like a bat. Like yeah, that's cool. But you know, it. I I hopefully I'm being clear what I'm trying to say. Like this this is what really angsts me about this movie. Is like you could have went there. You had so much potential to 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 go there with the with the horror. You had so much potential to, to go there with the blood, but you could tell that Sony were just no. Nah, we got to pull back. We got to pull back on the reins. You know this horse, man. You know it's it's a. We can't let this horse out of, the, out of its pen because if it goes too far, people weren't going to come see it. But I I generally feel feel like if they had let the reins go, it wouldn't improve the movie. I'm not saying it would have made the movie better, right? But it would have been in the film's favour if they'd just like, yeah, we made, you know, we tried our best. We experimented at making a superhero horror movie, right? We added blood, you know. When like one of the like so like Marvel's recently tried it by Werewolf of uh, uh, Werewolf by Midnight, which is a short um, sort of movie. Which you haven't seen it. It's on Disney Plus. It's really really good. I think I reviewed it last uh, last year. And um, you can check out my review if if you're interested. Um, but they did that film in black and white. And because they did it in black and white, they could have the blood. Very Kill Bill sort of style when Kill Bill is like the final scene of that movie where she's killing all those people on the dance floor. And she's, um, you know, slicing them with a katana, and as you imagine, cutting arms off, blood going everywhere, that sort of thing. You know, in Werewolf by Night, it was done in a lot more tasteful sort of way. But you had the blood spatter on the screen. You had blood spurting everywhere. You could see that there was actual damage being done. And it added to the suspense. And Sony could have beat Marvel to the punch. And be like, look, we tried a hand at doing a horror movie superhero film thing, right? And it either worked or it didn't work. Obviously, we'll never know if it could have worked with it because they didn't do it. But let's say, for example, they went for it. They could have been the first ones of like, we did it, you know, we tried it out. Um, people came, people didn't come. But either way, they could have been the first ones to go, yeah, we gave it a go. And I think that would have given a bit of a bigger boon for people to want to go see this movie. Of like, yeah, it's not a great movie. It gets a bit silly. But they stay true to what they're trying to do. They stay true to trying to do a horror movie. They try true to trying to do a vampire movie. You know, and you have to respect them for that. For me, and probably for a lot of viewers, they lost the respect when they didn't show as much blood. Now, I know I sound a bit crazy, a bit demented. But again, what you have to understand is if you're going to have somebody who's a vampire, whose whole crux is I need to feed, at least make me believe that he's feeding. You know what I mean? Give that believability to me. Otherwise, he, you know, I, I, I struggle to really believe that he's a vampire. Again, I know it sounds silly. It, for me, that's just how it feels. Like, if you're not going to show me or you're not going to prove it to me, is he really? You know, the closest we get to him properly seeing him drink blood is when he has those bloody IV bag things and he's drinking them like a slushy. That's the closest we get to actually properly see anything blood going into his system, right? And even there's moments where he's throwing up blood, but they kind of they, they show you it, but they don't. It's kind of like you see it, but through a crack of like a, a of a desk. So you don't actually watch him throw up the blood. It's like this whole movie was was blood phobic. Was like, no, we can't show the blood because I'll faint. You know what I mean? It's very blood phobic. This film is, which is odd because it's a it's a vampire movie. But I I, I will I will stop my rant there. Um, so anyway, you know, there's a huge fight scene at the end. Um, Michael fights his best mate beats him and then goes up in very Batman sort of style in, in, a, in a pile of sort of uh, bats and sort of le- it leaves the scene. And then the scene cuts to his nurse friend, which I forgot to mention, you know, Milo, before they had this big battle scene, basically killed her. Um, and then they flew off and Michael's like, oh gosh, he's dead. Oh no. And that's kind of makes him to go and fight his best friend and ends up sort of killing him. Um, and then he flies off. 
But then they have this sort of sequel bait where they try to be like, you know, he's he, it zooms in on this nurse, um, where where still where laying where she died where she was killed, and then she opens her eyes and her eyes are red, and she's now a vampire. Even though we never really saw any sort of hint or any like none of the other people that Michael killed or Michael fed off or any of the people that Milo killed or Milo fed off, none of them have come back as vampires or as we know because it was never set up. But you know somehow. This love interest of Michael's, uh, again, in sequel bait, now she's going to come back as a vampire. Even though, again, it was never hinted that this is something that Michael or Milo could do. But apparently this is something they can do, you know. So vampires are now in the Sony Spider-Verse. Okay, fine. Um, So they do the sequel bait. But also, what makes me laugh, right? This bit where I had to chuckle. Um, Because I already knew what these end credit scenes were. But seeing them with my own eyes and just trying to think of if I went to the cinema to watch this movie and to see both of these... um, To see both of these scenes in the the cinema, I would have laughed my ass up because they both don't make sense, right? So both of them pertain to the same character, right? And none of them make sense, right? But I'll try my best to explain. So the first one you'll see is where a, a rip will open up, right, above New York. It's the same rip, it's the same tear that we saw in the last Spider-Man film, right? Um, and that, for some reason, Adrian Toomes is transported from the MCU over to the Sony-verse, which, again, is fine. You know, I love Michael Keaton. You know, I love his version of, of Vulture, but let's be honest with each other here, Beans, right? Marvel and Kevin Feige, they probably weren't going to use his character again. He probably wasn't going to appear appear again. So I'm fine with Sony taking him and using him. That's fine. You know, I have no issue with that, right? Because they kind of they kind of did the same thing, actually, in the first Spider-Man movie, Spider-Man Homecoming, right? At the end of that movie, there was an end credit scene where um, the guy, Scorpion, basically, um, hinting at a Scorpion, which we still haven't seen Scorpion in the Spider-Man movies, but it was hinting at, like, this, this guy... Um, is going to pretend to be, is eventually going to be Scorpion. His character, the guy he was playing, does eventually become the sport Scorpion. Um, hinted that, oh, you know, I've got some friends that want to take this spider dude down. Um, and Adrian Toomes is like, if I knew who he was, he'd probably be dead by now. So kind of like he, he respects Peter and that he kind of, he likes Peter and like he doesn't really want to kind of give away his, his secret identity. All right. So keep that in mind. Okay. So, tears open. Agent Tomb is now in the Sony-verse, which, again, is fine. No problem with that. He'll probably get more use out of him. No problem, okay? Second, right, end credit scene. This part, th- this is one that blows, it makes no sense at all. But here it goes, right? So, for some reason, Michael Morbius is driving out into the desert, right, in the middle of nowhere, okay? Gets out of his car, um, and then in the distance, this... You see this big, this light sort of coming towards him, and eventually he gets close, and we can see that it's the vulture, right? And it's not a new suit, it's not a new wing suit, it's not a new sort of costume, anything like that. It's the same wing suit, flight suit, whatever you want to call it, that Tombs had from the um, Spider-Man Homecoming, which again makes no sense because, like, when he appeared in the cell um, in the first end credit scene, right? He was on. He he was in like prison uniform. Okay, he didn't have anything with him. He didn't bring the suit with him, right? But somehow he now has his suit, you know, a, original suit that he had from the Spider-Man movie, right? And he goes to meet Morbius because he invites Morbius there, and um, Morbius is like, "What do you want?" And the guy's like, "Well, you know, I've got a bit of a Spider-Man problem, and me and a couple friends want to know if you want to get involved to uh, help us out." And then Morbius basically goes, interesting. Then it ends, right? The thing I love about this movie, the thing I love about this, and again, what makes no sense, one thing that I love about it is that you never see Michael Keaton's face, right? He has his sort of, uh, his helmet down this whole time, which tells me that this was added in, this was an added in scene, right? And they couldn't get Michael Keaton to reprise it, right? So they just did like voiceover, which I don't know if this is voiceover that Michael Keaton did or it's just taking snippets of other sort of film uh, voice sort of voiceover they had for Michael Keaton from prior films. Um, 
rough on the first Spider-Man movie and they kind of pull it together because the pitch is off and it doesn't really make sense at times. Like, it doesn't really sound like he's there. It sounds like different levels and it just doesn't work. It does feel like they've taken snippets from here and there, right? So there's that. Um, but also, it makes no sense because in the Sony-verse, at this moment in time, there is no Spider-Man. As far as we know, there is no Spider-Man, right? There's Venom. And that's the closest thing we've got to Spider-Man. But there is no Peter Parker. There is no Miles Morales. There's nothing in this universe that's a Peter Parker, Spider-Man sort of thing, right? Other issue, right? Aging Tombs had no issue with Peter Parker, right? No issue whatsoever. He even knew who he was. And he still had no issue with him. He could have told anybody. He could have told the Scorpion guy or anybody in his cell, oh, yeah, you want to know Spider-Man? He's a 15-year-old called Peter Parker. He lives at this place with his aunt, right? He didn't. So why is it now he's in this new universe now? Why now does he have a hard on for, to kill Spider-Man? It makes no sense. You know what I mean? It makes no sense. And even you can't even say the fact that because Spider-Man wiped um, Peter, uh, Peter wiped everybody's memory so that they forget who Peter Parker is, right? You can't even use that as an excuse because again he has he still has no issue against Spider-Man. You know what I mean? So why would he go against Spider-Man? So there's many things of like this was added in. But it makes no sense why you'd add it in. But we'll never see. We'll probably never see where this goes because I don't see them doing another Morbius movie unless they're going to bring Morbius in into other films, you know. Um, unless you know Craven the Hunter, that movie's like a way they're going to bring Craven the Hunter into it is the fact of they're going to bring Craven into New York to hunt Morbius down. You know, maybe I don't know. Um, that wouldn't surprise me if they do do that, but we, we will see what the, what the Craven Hunter movie is. Um, so it's all a bit strange. I, I don't know how they're going to do it without a Spider-Man, but okay, fine. Um, so my overall thoughts is, you know, this movie has a good beginning, good setup, um, great visual effects, but bad editing at times. Um, way less gore than there should have been. Um, you know, you can tell that this movie wants to be a horror film and it should have lent more into the horror aspect of it but kept pulling back too much and it just let it just kind of pull back and just replace it with silly and no sense and no logic and everything was just silly like to Ty Reese is in this movie right he plays a copper but there's no, really no point him being in this movie you could have got any generic sort of actor to play this copper role because again he doesn't do anything right so there's no point of that at all, right? Um, but they should have lent harder into the horror. They really should have. You can tell that the Sony, um, the studio Sony should have not interfered, that they should have let the director, let the writer make the movie they wanted to make. And if the movie still flopped, it still flopped. But I'm, I'm not saying that it would have made it better. I feel like it just would have given it a lot more respect. And I think people probably would have enjoyed it a bit more if it if it lent into the horror aspect. You know what I mean? It, not saying it would have been a better movie, but it probably would have been a more interesting if it would have stuck with that and, and took away the less silliness. You know, they've got a whole scene that lasts for a, a minute and a half to two minutes of just Matt Smith dancing with no T-shirt on. No sense. I, I get why it's there. It's get to show that he's now got his energy back, that he now, you know, he's back to normal, that he can live a life, a normal life that he wants to live as well as having all these powers. But at the same stage, it's the fact of, you know, I don't want to see that. I don't want to see Matt Smith dance with no t-shirt on. Matt Smith is still the doctor to me. I don't want to see that. You know what I mean? Um, but also, you know, I guess they have to show off the fact of, you know, Marla's, you know, he, he has this puppy dog facade, but in, really in the inside, he's he's got this evil streak. He's got this sort of cruelty, sort of violent streak inside of him. I don't know. Um, but it also shows that sort of Sony, not just, not just the fact that they like to interfere, but also the fact of, once again, Sony are trying to put all their eggs in one basket. They're trying to force something that hasn't ha earned yet. So like Spider-Man 3. I love Spider-Man 3. I'll be I'm, I'll be honest with you. It's one of the few sort of things I'll admit that I, I think a lot of people agree, disagree with me on. I like Spider-Man 3, but I feel like there was too many cooks in the kitchen. There were too many characters. And this is the problem with Sony. And they did it again with the last the last sort of Spider-Man movies. Like, I loved all the characters, but once again, you can tell they're trying to shoehorn in this whole Sinister Six sort of thing. I'm like, yes, I really do want to see Sinister Six. I really do. But stop trying to spoon it, earn it, you know, build up to it. 
Stop trying to spoon feed it. Like they did it with The Amazing Spider-Man 2. Again, another one that I love. A lot of people don't love it. Um, but again, they tried to shoehorn characters in. Tons of characters. They even tried to shoehorn in Rhino near the end. Right? And I'm like, you're trying too hard. Stop putting all your eggs in one basket. Tease me. You know what I mean? Like, build it up. Make me earn it. You know, make me earn it. Make me sort of want to keep coming back. And then when you're ready, then show me. Like, yes, now we've got the Sinister Six. I'm going to do a Sinister Six movie. Don't keep trying to add things in. Again, and, you know, and that's what it feels like. They kept trying to add things and they add tombs in and they tried to add in the Vulture thing, which makes no sense. And they tried adding the whole Peter Park and, Sp- and they even mentioned Spider Man. But again, there's no Spider Man in the Sony verse. So what the fuck are they talking about? Now this makes. Not Morbius is. Like, because at the end of the movie. It's it's set up as Morbius is meant to be this anti-hero, this good guy, right? Kind of like in the vein of like the like not the Punisher, but like Daredevil sort of thing, like the sort of a a good guy at the end of the movie, right? So why would he have any sort of care about who Spider Man is? Like, who the fuck Spider Man? I, I don't know Spider Man. I don't give a shit. I'm a doctor, you know. I've, I've got my own shit to deal with. I'm a living vampire, right? I need to drink blood. I've got other things to deal with at the moment. I ain't got prob- I haven't got sort of time to deal with you and your whole spider person thing right go away old man fly away you know what i mean i've got things to deal with right so it makes no sense to the whole character morbius that the movie that we've just finished watching why now that you set him up being a hero is he now a good like a bad guy again makes no sense make your mind up movie what do you want to be you want to be a horror movie? Do you want to be a comedy? Do you want to be Morbius to be a good guy? Or do you want to be a bad guy? Do you want to be an anti-hero? Or do you want to just be evil? What do you want? What do you want? Tell me, because I want to defend your movie. I want to love your movie, but if you're not giving me anything to help you defend it, I can't defend it. You know what I mean? Um, and that's the issue. You know, it starts off good. It starts off interesting, but once you realize that they pull back on the horror, they pull back on the suspense, they pull back on the things that was working, and then they shoehorn in other things, and they shoehorn in comedy, and shoehorn in silly things, and bad editing, you just left there, you just left sitting there going, why? Why? You know what I mean? Why? You know, so don't watch, if you haven't watched this movie, don't watch this movie. Um, just stick with this review. This this, this is all you need, really. Um, I enjoyed it for what it was at the beginning. And you lost me and lost my respect when I noticed that you changed it. When I could tell you changed things, that's when you lost me. And that's when I just didn't enjoy as much. I went from paying attention to looking at my phone, right? To being really baffled about whatever it is you were trying to do at the end of this movie with the end credit scenes as well. You know what I mean? So it lost everything. So it started off good, ended off confusion, right? Um, so, yeah, so that's all I have to say. Rant over. Thank you for coming to my talk. Um, yeah, I was just really sort of lost with this film. I really was. Um, not that I'd hoped for better, not that I'd hoped for um, more. It was just, I don't know. It's like it, I was fed horror, and then I, 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 I got comedy, and that's you know, some like you know, sometimes horror comedy that works. Shaun of the Dead, perfect example, but it just didn't work here at all, um, and it really was morbid time because I wanted to morbid out of there. I know, terrible pun, I know, um, <laughs> but yeah, that's been my review of uh, Morbius. I've been talking for 55 minutes now. I didn't realize I was going to talk this much about this film. Um, But you have to when you start getting to the parts that make no sense. But here I am, probably the longest sort of review or the longest sort of episode I've done for season two up until this point. But um, that's my review, Morbius. I'm going to go off to the end now. I'm going to have a quick break before I do the end. And then um, we'll end it off quite nicely. So off to the end, shall we? So here I am at the end. Uh, if you're still with us, thank you very much for sticking around. Um, I know that was a long review, and I do apologise. Like I, I'll be honest, I I had a headache near the end of there. I had to take my glasses off because my eyes were stinging. Um, 
because of that sort of rant that I went into went I'll be honest, I didn't think I was going to be talking about this movie for as long as I have, so I'll keep this short and sweet. Um, but thank you very much for sort of sticking with it. But um, yeah, so let me know what you thought of, of Morbius, what you what you thought of this review. Um, if you're listening on uh, YouTube, uh, up there'll be a pinned comment at the top. Just sort of um, comment, uh, reply to that. Most likely the question will be under the lines of what do you think of the movie, what do you think of Morbius, that sort of thing. Just reply there. Um, if you're not uh, listening on um, YouTube, uh, then on Twitter, just um, you can either DM me or you can tweet me and let me know your thoughts and feelings there. Like I said, I didn't hate this movie. I didn't think it was a terrible movie. I didn't think it was bad. It was just I had hoped for more. You know what I mean? I had hoped. I I was given horror and got less. You know what I mean? Um, I went in empty. You know, I took it. I. I basically blanked off everything that I heard about it, all the reviews I'd seen of it. I just tried to blank it all off and try to go in new, go in blind. And even then, I, I found some enjoyment at the beginning and then after that, it just lost me. But, you know, it is what it is. It can't be helped. So, that's been my review. Uh, I've got to do this sort of the boring plugs now. Um, you don't have to listen to them if you don't want to. Um, but I do hope you do. Um so, as I mentioned, you can follow me on Twitter at nerdslash.com.pod. Um, you can also find this podcast on Spotify, um, Anchor, uh, Google Podcasts, Amazon Music Podcasts, YouTube, Audible. Also, if you listen to this on Spotify, don't forget to give me a star rating between one to five stars. Um, I'm currently at, I think, 19 um, ratings. So, all 19 of you that have rated so far, thank you very, very much. Um, it means a lot. I've actually been brought down from five... from uh, zero five point zero to four point eight now. So obviously, I guess somebody must have given me a three or four star review, which is completely fine. If if that's what you feel, you know, that's completely fine with me. I'm not judging. Um, but whatever you feel like is fair. Five stars, best thing you've ever heard in your life. To one star, it really is morbid time. Get out of here, run. Um, whatever you feel like is fair. One to five stars, I completely appreciate it. And um, yeah, so I've been your host, Luke the Human. Um, Thank you very much for listening, my fellow beans, uh, for listening to the end as well. Um, you've been listening to the Nerd Sergeant podcast. I will catch you in the next one. It really is the end now, so I'll be more been off. <laughs> more been time. Bloody hell. What was this movie? Bloody hell. Oh, my God. <laughs>